feeling your palate right now, but good morning. Good morning. And an ancient way of breathing is to put your hand like this just under your uh, shoulder blade and say, Dua. Dua. Say it louder. Dua. Dua. Ancient African breathing. Uh, my name is Professor Cedric Patrick. I'm an associate professor here in Africana Studies, as well as the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois and Fannie Lou Hamer Institute for Academic Achievement, an institute that promotes uh, student success through campus and community partnerships. And I want to welcome you to our 50th anniversary of, the, of our existence. <laughs> Black History Month, and this is our what we're calling our kickoff legacy lecture uh, with uh, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Dr. Leslie Small. He'll be here in a bit. Um, we did pass around uh, flyers uh, of the full History Month activities, as well as individual flyers, uh, so that uh, you can take a look at and consider uh, joining if you are able. Um, Logistically, I'm going to introduce our chair of our department, uh, Dr. Teresa White, and then we will uh, uh, go into a quick five to seven minute uh, history of the department from uh, one of our professors and uh, advisors in uh, the EOP Educational Opportunity Program, James, Dr. James Henry, and then uh, I will be reading off uh, in your program uh, the bio for Dr. Leslie Small. And then Leslie should be here. As a student uh, in the 90s, he's always convenient in the way. But it's all good. He's traveled all over the world uh, recently uh, through Africa and he uses that, and as you'll see um, uh, in his bio. So without further ado, let me introduce to you our chair of our department, Dr. Teresa White. Thank you, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you so very much for joining us here this morning on this Friday, um, uh, Friday early, early afternoon, or early morning, I should say. So as Dr. Hackett mentioned, I'm the chair of Africana Studies. Uh, this is my third year as chair. And so uh, Africana Studies has a, a rich and uh, full and checkered history here at uh, CSUN. But as you know, this is our 50th anniversary, so we are delighted that we stand before you and able to share with you the kinds of accomplishments and achievements that we have uh, uh, in, uh, manifested so far here at CSUN. So I always want to remind uh, some students when we talk about Black History Month because it's just sort of this thing that people do every February. And I want to just have you recall and have you understand that in 1920, it started in 1926 and it was actually called the Negro Week. Uh, and it was formed by um, Carter B. Woodson. So 50 years later, 1976, that's another 50 years. That 50 year number seems to be percolating uh, quite, quite frequently. So 50 years later, it was coined uh, Black History Month. And ever since then, every president that has held the office has always acknowledged it as a period of time where we uh, give credence and acknowledge the contributions of people of the black, of the black diaspora in this country. Uh, we make up a significant and rich and checkered ta tapestry in this country. And so we always want to make sure that students understand the relevance of black history. But it is only a month. And I want to say that we don't necessarily just celebrate for a day, for a month, for a week, for a month. We celebrate it every day, all year long, in the African Studies Department in particular. So we wanted to be sure that we, we, we acknowledge and honor this 50-year contribution that we made on this campus. And so we start thinking about, well, how do we do that? How do we talk about that? Because oftentimes when you think about people from the black diaspora, you might think about them as sort of one-dimensional. But we know that that's not the case. We know that there is texture and there's depth uh, there's contributions that we make. And so in thinking about how to celebrate and honor this, this achievement, 50 years ago on this campus, um, you know, in 1969, we started off, and Dr. Henry's going to give you some more detailed information, but in 19, 1969, we started off at the, at the Afro-American uh, History Department. 
Uh, then in 1998, we became Pan, Pan African Studies, and then in 2015, we became Africana Studies. So we're broad and we're rich, and so we're, we're, we're um, referred to in many different ways. But the way that we wanted to think about this particular occasion, starting it off today, uh, the 50th year, is to, sort of, to, to segue through a series of themes. And so as you move through the plethora of wonderful and rich events that we have designed for you for this entire month, um, at first, we were really thinking about sort of the health and wellness and the value of black studies and really heightening your awareness and your consciousness, i.e. today, it's uh, uh, raising consciousness, the legacy lecture. We're starting off here with, of course, um, um, Dr. Smalls. And then as we move into the second week, we want to think about the contributions that we make from, from, uh, from a black aesthetic perspective. What we're doing, how do you see us in film and TV and theater and the arts? And then the third week, we can't, certainly we can't um, um, not give credence to the social, the political, and the uh, uh, environmental, social justice, and, and activism that we're engaged in. So there's a series of, of opportunities for you to engage and understand that more deeply. And then we're going to close up by thinking about how uh, black excellence and athleticism intersect with one another. And then we'll have, uh, ultimately, we'll have our closing, closing reception at the Soraya, at the Soraya Performing Arts Theater. So I anticipate seeing a lot of you throughout this semester, throughout this, um, this month. And again, I appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having a real splash and making this particular Black History Month even more special because it is, in fact, uh, giving credence to 50 years. Counting 50 years is a long time. Most of you in this room were probably not even a blip on the screen 50 years ago. So thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys often through the rest of this month. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, now I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Dr. James Henry, uh, who's going to give us kind of a brief history of our department uh, since 69, uh, when students actually were at the forefront you know, of designing this department and became the catalyst for other ethnic uh, studies departments. So let me give a round, please give us a round of applause for Dr. James Henry. Uh, I actually want to start off with uh, a proverb. Our existence here started with this store, right? And the proverb goes like this: There was a, a lion, a baby lion that had been orphaned, and uh, the baby lion, the lambs, and. Uh, adopted him and raised him as a lamb. And so uh, the lamb would go to the water and drink, the lion would go to the water and drink with the lamb. And then one day he got lost. And one day uh, a, a male lion grabbed him and, and the, the baby lion was going, bah, bah. And the male lion said, what's that sound you're making? He said, Come with me. And so he took him to the water. And he said, look upon the water. You see that? He said, you are not a lamb. You are a lion. The lions roar. In fact, lions eat lambs. <laughs> and I want you to think about that. Keep that on your mind All right, as I go through this. Let's see, Brother Smalls is going to talk about uh, the arch of consciousness. But another part of that that I wanted to talk about is Courage and the courage it took to get African study, Africana studies started uh, at California State University. All right, so it started with uh, an event that happened on the football team. And, uh, me and Dr. Hackett are putting up football alumni, so we we always have this certain attachment with that original story. And there's a couple of stories uh, that are floating around, but one story is that one of the assistant football coaches literally kicked one of the football players on the team. So he being friends with some of the founders, original founders of the original Black Student Union, uh, got together and, and like, we're gonna do something about this. All right, so they were challenging the administration, they wanted to coach terminated, they wanted an athletic director terminated, and now there was a lot going on in the country as far as movements are concerned. So the, I have pictures of Archie Chapman, Jerome Walker, and Bill Burwell, who were part of the original 
black student union. Uh -huh. That's Je Jerome Walker is the first one. Bill Burwell, who was actually my speech teacher in that kind of things. And uh, uh, Archie Chapman, who we also, even though he's been brought back to the campus and recognized him for his courage and contribution to our family. All right, so, and I encourage you to revisit uh, those demands. All right, so they took a list of demands to Bay Raymond Hall, which our administration used to be housed, and they uh, held them, so to speak, and gave them the list of demands. All right, so that took about uh, four hours to hold them. Uh, so, the, uh, of course, they left, they were able to get away. Uh, others started to, uh, and again, I'm giving you a really swift, quick, brief version, all right? Other demonstrations started, all right? They had allies. I encourage you to have the courage to have allies when you are uh, requesting demand. All right, we cannot do this alone by ourselves. So after the uh, hostage situation, uh, they did go away and they were housed in churches and people's homes in Pacoima. Uh, so during another demonstration, because the students, Latino students, black students, BSU, students for a democratic society, they still started protesting. And uh, at one point, they were in front of the administration building again, Bay Raymond Hall. But this time, the police had been inside the building, and they were waiting for them inside the building. So once the crowd got big and they were at the dorm, I mean, at Bay Raymond Hall, police burst open the door, and they just started beating everybody with their sticks, all right, with the police sticks. And in fact, if you watch Storm at Valley State, and I encourage you to watch that film as well, it's on YouTube. One, uh, one of the students was actually poked in the eye uh, with a police baton. Uh, right. So again, if you're going to be about activism and movement, I just want you to understand that sometimes it's going to take some courage and consciousness. All right. So here's uh, you know I love history, in the academic, right? <laughs> here's a Sunday article. Student in control building for four hours at Valley State, all right, and they're archived too. So you can, I encourage you as a student uh, to do, you know, history and go check out what was going on during that time period. Here is the actual list of demands, all right. And I'll just read one, number three. The president will dismiss who is that? A volunteer football coach and bar him from the campus, all right? So I guess this might have been the one who did the swift kick, all right? This the man, all right? If you haven't gotten a copy of it, get it. Some of these we may need to revisit now, all right? One of the arguments they were saying at that time was, well, we just can't find the students, all right? Our numbers are low now, so, okay, well, if the students are not there, let's go find them, all right? Let's go find them. And finally, the, uh, and, and again, I want you to understand that this is also not only courage, but it takes time, all right? These, it was almost a full year, right, from November 68 all the way to June of 69 that they kept on protesting, all right? So eventually, the president of the university uh, relented and he didn't give in to all the demands, particularly, uh, letting everybody who was involved go free. So some of them were arrested and fined on serious uh, charges, uh, kidnapping, uh, conspiracy, and all that. So I want you to understand, like Dr. White said, it was a checkered history some, at some point. So anyway, here we are now, 50th anniversary. We have stars out there in the world, like Brother Smalls, uh, majors and, you know, academia and the media and law, I would encourage you, if you can't double major in Africana studies, then just major. If you can't major in it, then minor. If you can't minor, at least take all of your GEs, because you probably didn't have any before you got here, you're probably not gonna have time after you leave. All right, so again, I leave you with that.
encourage you to look up because it's again a deep, rich, interesting history. And uh, this brother is just gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's one of our uh, loudest, roaring lions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, for, for giving us a brief history. 22 years later, I would arrive to this campus in 1991 um, on a football scholarship, and Bob Burke uh, was our head coach. And uh, some of us student athletes uh, were struggling, even the scholarship ones, and uh, we decided to create uh, this organ student organization called Black Student Athletic Association. This came at the time uh, of the Rodney King built uh, beating uh, somewhere near Bacoima, Lakeview Terrace area. So it was really close and near and dear to our hearts of what was going on in the, the outer um, space of this campus. And there's some micro uh, things that were going on here. We also, uh, along with the Pan African Studies Department at the time, had a list of demands and protested. Um, and I remember being in uh, President Cleary's office at the time. Didn't know what the heck I was doing, but I knew that I wanted to uh, get into the fight, and I was just taking notes. Anyhow, during that time, I ended up meeting this brother, uh, Dr. Wesley Smalls, who was the BSU president at the time. Very dynamic in terms of the um, provocative approach that he had and the folks that he brought in that gave me a sense of uh, who I was and, and the purpose, uh, you know, in Africana studies or in a uh, African worldview, there's always a purpose and he helped to provide that purpose. Uh, never expected to become a faculty member. Uh, I was a student in your shoes, staff member at EOP and now a faculty member. A lot of that I attribute to this man. So let me read off uh, his, um, his bio, and you can read along with me if you like. Uh, the guy is a world traveler. But Brother Small is taking Hollywood by storm. He just finished the third season of Heart of the City, original series for the Comedy Central, and is preparing for his next feature film, Undercover Brother, part two. Filming, uh, or uh, just filmed uh, last fall. Next year, this year, Leslie is uh, anticipating a big box office success with the release of his just completed film, Two Minutes of Fame, for Lionsgate slated to hit the box office this spring. Fresh off the blockbuster, Kevin Hart's What Now? Leslie also just completed production on Kevin Hart's concert film, Irresponsible, filmed uh, at the Q2 Arena in London. These projects come on the heels of the successful production for Netflix starring Cat Williams and Mike Epps, uh, coming, uh, coming off two successful theatrical releases with uh, Kevin Hart, Let Me Explain and Laugh at My Pain. He's finding success with his sitcom as well, One Love, airing on Bounce TV. Leslie recently teamed up with Gary Owen to produce his special for Showtime, I Agree With Myself. These projects follow his directing and producing of the comedy series Shaq's All-Star Comedy Jam for Showtime. Prior to this series, Leslie directed the feature film A Good Man is Hard to Find. In the successful <coughs> release of the comedy film Steve Harvey, Steve Harvey, Don't Trip, He Ain't Through With Me Yet. This film celebrates Steve's 20 years of success as a comedian, the second installment Steve Harvey I'm Still Trippin' is currently top of the charts in sales. Hair Show, his second feature, was released in theaters across the nation. This film starred Monique and Taraji P. Henson and included special appearances by Serena Williams and Vivica A. Fox. Was, uh, Hair Show was also co-produced by Urban Magic Johnson. Leslie received, by the way, just a shameless plug. I'm so glad as a Laker fan that uh, LeBron's back when we got that to win. This is awesome. This is awesome. And overtime, too. It's a dramatic fashion. Uh, anyways, uh, I won't digress too much. Uh, Leslie received his start in theater under the tutelage of Hal DeWitt 
His professional directorial debut was the popular stage play, The Diary of a Black Man. He then went on to direct music videos and documentaries, including Adventures of the American West for the Disney Channel. He is more than just a filmmaker. He's also an intellectual and an innovator, and he completed his doctoral studies in economic development at the University of Southern California, and he's driven by the exploration of the intimate reality shared by people no matter what race, religion, creed, or socioeconomic status. This awareness allows him to incorporate these themes into his films. Expect to hear the name Leslie Small for many years to come as he is only getting started. Let me hear you say Leslie Small. Where'd he go? Hey, hey, hey. Leslie Small. Okay, okay. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Leslie Small. Oh, Lord, I'm being mic'd, y'all. How's everybody doing today? That's amazing. I was listening to that. I was like, whoa, OK. So we did a lot. Um, uh, I want to start off by just telling an interesting story. We're talking about awakening of consciousness. And, and I think that when I listen to, this, to the history of, of black students in the Pan-African Studies Department and the Africana Studies Department, you know, there was this sort of um, idea that they were doing things, demands, and those kind of things. When I came to this campus, one of the things that sort of dawned on me, because I had been working around some really powerful people and intelligent minds around the world, was that there was a different consciousness that was necessary. We had these wonderful students. We all sort of were motivated. But our consciousness was needed to be changed, needed to be transformed. At the time, cognitively, I didn't really understand that. I just felt it, right? I don't, you know how you feel some things, right? And you say some things need to change. And, and later on, you can go back and think about it and say, OK, we, from a cognitive perspective, needed to elevate our consciousness. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Tell a quick story. There is, how many people have ever been in a jungle where you like, not in a theme park, but like <laughs> in a jungle where wild animals are and lions and tigers? And, They'll come after you. How many of you ever done that, right? It's, it's a different reality. I've spent a lot of time in jungles around the world. And the reason I go to jungles around the world is because when you're out there, for instance, if you get killed by a lion, no one's going to have a funeral. Not, nobody's going to be sad, right? It's what they do. Um, and there's a natural order to what they do. And there's a natural respect. And when you learn to harmonize with, with, with nature, then it takes you to another level. Quick story. Uh, scenario. There's a pride of lions. They live together. And if you've ever been around a pride of lions, you'll see that there's a man. He's really generally the strong guy. And he has a, a dark brown mane. And when he becomes the leader of that pride, that's when his mane turns brown. Everybody else, all the other males in that pride, have a very light golden mane. And it's really clear that that's the man over there. Now, the interesting thing about him is he sleeps 20 hours a day doesn't do anything. He sort of gets up after the females have gone and hunted, go get something to eat, he goes back to sleep. <laughs> but if something happens to one of those women, or something happens to someone in his pride, and he has to stand up, he's not coming to negotiate. He's not coming to talk to you. He's coming to take you down. That's his function. He's a protector. And he makes sure that the, that the, that the safety of that, that pride is intact. And if the interesting thing about it, I, I remember I was in Johannesburg about two years ago, and we were observing this pride. And this one male had two sons. And you know, he had about 15 women in the pride. But he has his woman of the month. That's what they explained to it. That's his woman of the month over there, right? And his son, who was the woman of the month's son, got too close to her. And he stood up. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And he comes, boom. And we all got scared because we weren't even close to him. But you know, when he's walking, his, his muscles, and, and he's looking at it, and the little son just rolled over on his back and sort of skimmied out the way. And we said, why, why is he doing that? He said, because at some point, that little son is going to challenge him for his authority. And right now, he's got to show him that I'm in charge. And he got a little too close to his woman of the month. So he had to get out the way. Imagine that. now. They work and they live in a very cohesive environment. Now, say you take that pride of lions and you put them in a cage at a, at a zoo, if you will. 
Now this pride of lions is sitting there, and there's this cage keeper. And he walks around every day, and he has a bucket of meat. And he lets these lions see that bucket of meat. And, but he never gives it to them. And he, day after day, he comes by, and he shows them a bucket of meat. And then at some point, he takes one little sliver of meat, and he throws it into the cage. What's going to happen? Them lions will tear each other apart to get to that. But is that their name? Is that, is that who they are? But they've been reduced to that. Their consciousness has been reduced to a level that is more barbaric than anything that would happen in their nature. And so what happens with consciousness, a lot of times we get put in situations where, we call it artificial, where the environment has been artificially trans transformed. And that environment then dictates a different set of relationships. And then when you take those different set of relationships and you normalize them, then you become something that is opposite of your nature. And then you transfer that information from one generation to another generation. So for generations, you are now operating outside of the consciousness of what you were born and meant to be. And that's where we are in America. That's what African Americans inherited in this country. We weren't always having to struggle and fight and ask for, can we just be human? But we got to a point where something happened. Let's talk about that. Let's, let's just go down that path a little bit. Imagine this, it was funny. I was, uh, and I don't know if this is true or not, so don't, you know, I know we got the mics on, but whatever. Um, <laughs> I was in London, I went to this museum, it was a Darwin Museum, it was Darwin, Charles Darwin. And when I went to the museum, it was about his theory of evolution, right? And I looked at this chart that they had up there, and it had, met, it had like these little animals, to monkeys, to standing on their feet, to hominoids, to cro to Neanderthal, then to man. And Darwin was arguing that they came from animals, that their progression in life was from an animal to a man. And I was like, whoa, that's really crazy. That's interesting. Because then when I was in Egypt and I went and looked at the Medunetar, and I looked at the history of how we came to be as Africans, they didn't have a relationship with us coming from animals. So I'm trying to figure this out. I said, why over here in Europe do they say they come from animals? In Africa, they're just created divine. You know, there's all of these images of gods creating, right? And that's an interesting mindset. So I said, well, let's, 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 let's just play that out. Not that I'm saying that I'm giving any credibility to what Darlene was saying, but let's just play that out. So you struggle for a million years or so to come from this animal into a man, into a man. This is a scenario. Just, just play with me for a minute. Then you start to travel the world, and you see people, a group of people, living on a continent doing some amazing things. They, they sing, they create poetry, they do plays, they dance, they have ceremonies. And you say to yourself, well, we don't do that. Because if you go to like Rome and you look at the Colosseum, what did they do for fun? They kill people. They had gladiators and they would, and they would yeah, and they would kill them. And they would fight to the death. This was their entertainment. It was two different sorts of realities, right? But the one thing that you would notice is, is that these people in this continent called, well, it was called Alabucalan. It wasn't Africa. They, that's, a, that's more of a Greek term. But in Alabucalan, they found that these people could harmonize with the earth. If it was cold, didn't matter. If it was hot, didn't matter. If, 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 they needed, if they needed to be out amongst wild animals, didn't matter, because their frequency was a little different. They were in harmony with Earth. They lived. It's funny, I was down in a, a southern uh, uh, Thailand, and I was hanging out with these monks. And these monks would go into a water hole every day, and wild tigers would come out of the water hole and play with these monks, right out of, right out of the jungle. And this is not something I'm, I was heard, some I saw. And then when you talk to them, you say, well, why do these monks, why do these tigers just hang out with you? And they do, they say, how long you been doing this? Oh, for hundreds of years. But these then wild tigers would go right back up in there into the jungle and kill a wildebeest or something and, and, and eat it. 
The interesting thing was if you or I walked around those wild tigers, guess what would happen? They would kill us dead, quick, not even a thought about it. And I'm saying to myself, well, what, what is it about them that makes them non-threatening or makes them in harmony with a wild tiger? That's very interesting to me. There was a report a couple of weeks ago that a little girl was lost and she was in the wilderness and when she came out, she was three years old, and they said, well, how'd you survive the cold? And she said, the bear kept me warm. This was like three weeks ago. The bear just sort of took her in. So what is that? What is that? What is the ability to harmonize? So I talked to the monks. I said, what do you do? They said, we don't, you know. I said, what do you do with your life? After they finish playing with the tigers, guess what they go do? They go and meditate and pray for the rest of the day. They go and meditate and pray. And then they go into the city and they put their hands out. They put their hands out and they wait for people to put coins in. And then once they get enough for the day, they then go and do their work. We would say that's sort of, this was sort of passive. If we just saw them doing this, this was passive. But these same people play with, with lions. These same people play with wildebeest. These same people that do this, that depend on this, are there. So what is that? What is that frequency? What is that consciousness? And that's where we are today. Because I can tell you, I go to a lot of churches around America and stuff like that. And if one of these preachers walked over there into that jungle, <laughs> I don't care how much they can preach. Like <laughs> you cannot preach to a wild tiger. Right? The question becomes is what are we learning? What are we doing? What are we doing? And how are we transforming ourselves? Why are those monks that we sort of would look at and say they don't have any money? The only clothes they have on their back is what they have. They don't have any possessions. They don't have homes. They live in a commune. Why are they so in harmonized, harmonized with the earth and we are not? That's an interesting question. Because let's go a little further. In 19, no, it was 1898. There was a group of monks in the Himalayas, and some scholars decided to go over and study them. And the, and the monks in the Himalayas were very, 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 very uh, private. They would never let this happen. So these guys decided to go and study. They, they allowed these scholars to come over for two years and take a look at how they were living. And they wrote, they documented what they saw. And what they saw were things that you would be, not be, you'd be amazed of. For instance, Camille was one of the main, was the head monk. And he said to them, you need to go to a different village, but it's going to take you five days to walk there. But when you get to that village, um, I'll be there waiting on you. It doesn't take me five days. <laughs> so they, he assigns a guide, and the guide takes them on this five-day journey. And when the guy gets, to, gets them to the village, Camille is there. How you doing? And then the people in the village report that, oh, he just left the same day. Right? Watch this. So the people, when the guy gets the people to the jungle, I'm just telling you what the book says. When the guy gets the people to the new village, he, the people come and they, they, they make a lot to do with him. And then he walks to the edge of the village and his body is on the ground and he gets back inside of his body and stands up. This is what these European scholars from Oxford report that they saw. The next thing is, is that as Camille, the head guy, was walking in the forest with them, the birds and stuff would just sort of come and hang out with him, right? And the trees seemed like they bowed to him. And that anything that he needed to do in nature just sort of happened. And they said there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a cave in the Himalayas there where there's never been a negative word spoken in this cave. There's never been any negative energy. So that when you go into this cave, it, it has transformative powers for you. Now, why am I saying all of this? Because we are led to believe that there are things about us that would seem impossible that used to just be normal. When you, when, when you talk about the pyramids, right? It's, oh, we, the aliens created those. We can't figure out how that was done. Why not? Because it was a different mentality. It was a different consciousness that produced the ability to make those pyramids, a consciousness that has been killed and has been deadened. Why am I saying all of this when it comes to our story? Let's go back. If we were like those monks hanging out in the jungles, and, and we were, because you know, there, you can go on YouTube and you can see Bushmen in Africa, and you got these lions that have just killed a wildebeest, and the Bushmen come and tell the lions to go away, and they, they take the, 
that is not happening unless you have a certain frequency because those lines will kill you on site, right? This is happening today. So what happens to us? How did we lose that and why was it necessary for our consciousness to be changed? Why was it necessary for us to be put to sleep, for us to be separated from ourselves? Let's think about it. I want to, I see these people. They can go in water, they can go in cold, they can work in darkness, they can work in heat, and I want to enslave them. But if I enslave their bodies only, right? If I put you in a torture chamber, if I, if I make you walk a thousand miles from the east to the west, and then I put you in a dungeon, and it's 110 degrees outside, and the dungeon is even hotter, and I put you in that dungeon for six months. What happens to the weak people in that dungeon? They die. What happens to the mentally weak people in that dungeon? Then who emerges from the dungeon? The strongest of the strongest. So now I'm going to take you and I'm going to put you on a ship. The strongest of the strongest. Watch this. And I'm going to put you in the bottom of a ship. I'm going to chain you together. Then I'm going to take you for three months while you stay on the bottom of that ship across the ocean. People are dying on that ship. What's going to happen to the weak ones? They're going to die. Who's going to get off that boat? This is another process of elimination. So something superhuman is getting off that boat. Right? Right? Then I'm going to take you and mate you with one another. Now remember, I already seen you in the jungles sitting in ice and your body gets warmer. Sitting in the heat, your body gets cooler, right? Now and all of a sudden, I've, I've done this process of elimination where I've weeded out the weakness and then I mate you. How do I keep you in that condition of slavery for three centuries? It's not a physical thing. It's a conscious thing. I have to make you believe you belong there. I've got to separate you from the truth of your existence. So I make some laws. You can't speak your language. Because if you speak your language, you'll be able to tell your story. You can't sing your songs. You can't play your instruments. The only way you can express love is as a breeder. Now, wait, wait, wait. Let's deal with that, though. That's very interesting. Because you could have brought us here and loved us. You could have brought us here and said, hey, we're going to educate you. You could have brought us here and said, we're going to make you the best and help you become the best you can. But that wasn't the choice. The choice was to not only enslave your body, but to transform your consciousness so that your consciousness would equate to your enslavement. I can't keep you enslaved for 300 years if I don't have your mind convinced that that's what you belong. So what would the preacher in, in, in the slave time say? He would get up on a podium and he said, who gave you your master? And the congregation would say, God gave us our master. What is your master's job? And the congregation would say, to be over us. Then the preacher said, well, how long will you serve your master? And the congregation said, until we die. Imagine that. So they took that which we understood to be divine. We took that what we understood to be godly, and we used that to transform your consciousness. So then what happened? When we were in Africa, we didn't have a concept of faith and belief. Now, I know this is going to touch you guys a little wrong way, but just stay with me for a second. We didn't understand faith and belief. We weren't faithful people. We weren't believing people. We were seekers. If we wanted to know something, we sought it. We went and got it. We didn't, faith and belief says, okay, you know what? Something is going to happen over there and just believe that it's going to happen. Something's going to happen over there and just have faith. But we all grew up in the church. Jesus didn't say, I believe there's a God. He didn't have faith that there was a God. He said, there is a God. He knew there was a God. Jesus didn't believe he could heal you. He just said, get up and walk. There was no faith there. He didn't have faith that 
that things were going to happen? So you kill me, I'll be back three days. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm, yeah. But they taught us to have faith and belief in something that we cannot see or, or, or not perceive of because we were cut off from that consciousness. Jesus had a consciousness, and even when it says he wept, it's because he believed that the people couldn't acquire the same consciousness. It's amazing. Now watch this, because he goes into Africa as a child. And what does he see? He sees people touching and healing. He sees people doing things that we would consider to be miraculous. And then he comes out doing the same thing. So there's a consciousness that you must understand that the way they've taught us these things is to have faith and belief in them, but not to acquire them, not to work within them. If you talk and you go around the world and you look at people that live to be 100 years old, 110 years old, 100, they all share a few things in common. One is, uh-oh, they're coming. One is, <laughs> everything, <laughs> everything that they do comes from the ground, from the earth. This earth is sacred. They don't destroy it. They don't mass mistreat it, right? They eat vegetables from the ground. You talk to people that are 100 years old, all you got to do is say, where's your garden? And they'll tell you, oh, my garden is right outside. And I got some tomatoes and I got some, it's, it's common. Everything is right here. But what happens is when we start talking about a, a, a consciousness, when we start to change our consciousness, and let's talk about it in four different realities. We're talking about mind, we're talking about body, we're talking about emotion, and we're talking about energy. And when you take those four elements of your existence and you put them together and you focus, there is nothing that can stop you. Nothing that can stop you. Think about this. How many people get up in the morning and say, I'm going to have a certain emotion today. Today I'm going to have, today I'm going to be happy all day. Or today I'm going to be joyful. Or today I'm going to be harmonious. And if you were to say that and make that your daily goal, today I'm going to be happy. And somebody comes and just says something to piss you off. <laughs> what does it take for you to have to stand, maintain happiness? You've got to take all of your energy, yeah. right? and focus and discipline yourself, mm -hmm. right? So that that happiness can withstand whatever comes your way. Isn't that what Martin Luther King was doing? When he talked about peaceful protests, he says, I am going to be peaceful. And when you come at me calling me this and calling me that and beating me, I'm still going to maintain a posture of peace. What has to happen for you to do that? That's not weakness. In fact, that's probably the strongest posture you can have. But that takes complete and utter conscious transformation. You have to focus every, every element of your body to be able to get there. Martin, Malcolm X, you think they were, walking, were working together differently, but they weren't. Malcolm X said, sister, you are black and you are beautiful. You know, that's the first time those words were uttered on this country, on this continent. To be black in the 60s was the worst thing you could be anywhere on this earth. From a social perspective, it was stigmatized to be anything on earth. And here's this six foot five black man with a clean shave wearing a suit saying, sister, you're black and you're beautiful and I'm not trying to have sex with you. What does that do? That transforms a consciousness. They didn't follow him because of the words he spoke. They followed him because of an energy. Right? Conscious transformation. So when I got to this campus and I was walking around and I'm looking at students, I'm saying like, yo, we just need to do some things that, 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 would, that would have us all be in the environments of people with conscious elevation. And, and how do we do that? We had some really clear points. One summer, now all of this took place, remember, in a year and a half. So you have to understand, we weren't here for like 10 years or something like that. We were here for a year and a half. The summer before we started, we had a retreat. And we said, here are the things we're going to lay out. This is the things we're going to do. Now, it just so happens I arrived at the 25th anniversary of the Pan-African Studies Department on this campus. And we decided to celebrate it. 
But we, de I, I, we just decided to celebrate it from a different perspective. I said, you know what? The first thing I want to do is bring some scholars here. So we reached out to several scholars, Ivan Van Sertima, Dr. Anderson, um, and we had these scholars come in. I said, the other thing we want to do is celebrate religion. So we created a, a whole week of revivals where we had each major church in this environment come in with their choirs and their preachers, and they preached at night, and they sang, and every night there was some sort of sort of gospel event taking place. We also bought some of our great poets. We brought Maya Angelou to the campus. We bought, uh, uh, um, what was the, it wasn't Nikki Giovanni, but it was uh, Sonia Sanchez to the campus. We, uh, then we wanted to have a political involvement, so we asked the Speaker of the House at that time, which was Willie Brown, he came to the campus. Um, we also wanted to have a cultural sort of dynamic, so we went and found a survivor of the Holocaust his name was Zev Keatum. We invited him to the campus. And so we kept inviting and doing things, and this whole week was going to be this thing. And it culminated with us inviting Minister Louis Farrakhan to the campus. And that's where things got a little crazy on this campus, because we started getting attacked, right? Um, and, you know, me, I'm, you swing at me. I'm going to try to, you know, it's, you know, I'm not. My consciousness is different. <laughs> so. So we had some conflicts with uh, other organizations, and it got a little heated. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, Minister Farrakhan came, and he spoke. And here's what's really interesting, because I was walking on campus after he spoke, because shortly after he spoke, we had an earthquake here in Northridge. Mm -hmm. And on stage that night that Minister Farrakhan spoke, he said that for what this campus had done to the black students, trying to just get an education, this campus will fall. And within weeks, the Northwoods earthquake hit right here on this campus. Wow. And, and I never put that together until I was walking on campus one day, and the president of campus, Belinda Wilson, walked up to me and said, you the guy that's responsible for destroying my campus. Ooh. I said, what did I have to do? Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. But I hadn't even paid attention that he had said that on stage. I had to go back and look at what he had said, right? And whether that's coincidence or not, that was reality. That's what happened. Because as students, we had transformed who we were. Now let's look at it. Most of the students that were working in the BSU at that time have gone on to do their PhDs, have become educators, have become lawyers, doctors, have become very successful. You heard this brother say right here, his consciousness was changed by the work that we were doing. The work that we were doing, the consciousness doesn't change because you just sit and say, I want to have a new consciousness. You've got to try yourself. You've got to put some fire and make it through the fire. And if you can come through the fire unscathed, then your consciousness changes. And if you look at that group of students, and I've, I, I didn't realize until, we, until you invited me back the other day, Troy Strange is the mayor down in... in, in in Indio, like, we have mayors. This, this group of students that worked in this one year. Now watch this. We didn't have the money to do these events, but we sat on this campus, where's the money at? And you know who had money? Each department, each dean. So what did we do? We went to every dean on this campus and said, you have a discretionary fund. We need some of that dough to do the projects that we had. Now they've changed the rules since then. <laughs> you, you, you can't do that. But that's where we got the money from. Where do we get the concept from? We all grew up in the black church. After the preacher start preached, they passed the plate. <laughs> so we said, where are the plates at on this campus that we can go and get this money? Not only did we do that, we said, well, look, this, you know, there's an AS president. OK, we're going to make the AS president one of our guys, right? There's senators. We're going to make the senators our people. There's these different departments on campus. We're going to make those our people. And in one year, we, had, we, had set, we put the AS president in office. We took over space and all these other organizations. We had the Senate that we were controlling. We were controlling most of the main organizations on campus. So we were able to then utilize that power to be able to go forth and do something. Now, what do we do with the money that we made? We created and bought books and paid tuition for students. There was a house over there called the, it was empty, it was called, we called it the Black House. We got that house back, we renovated that house. And then on Wednesdays and Fridays we would have food there and we'd have study sessions. Because one of the things that we understood here is that if we're gonna cause this much trouble, the one thing that they can't be able to do in an academic setting is say, you guys are bad students. So what was our, our philosophy? We're gonna have 3.5s, 3.8s, 4.0s. We're gonna work together. We're going to have the academic standard that makes us, if you want to come after us, it's got, it can't be on grades. 
There's a, the, the sundial, he said, we challenged, we challenged all of our history professors to a debate in the center of campus. It's a big picture on the sundial where we are all standing with, uh, in front of book tables of books, and, you, 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 we're, uh, and that's what they call it on campus. But we challenged the professors because we were saying that Western culture is leaving us out. Western civilization is leaving us out. The way you are teaching about us is not right. And so it's, even though we're students, come on out and let's talk about this. Right. So, but this all happened in one year. So what we did is we said, we have a different consciousness. And the story that you've been telling of us, the narrative that has been created of us, uh, of us globally is not accurate. And so what we wanted to do is have a profound implementation in terms of how we see ourselves and we transform that narrative. Now, they wanted me to get out of here as soon as possible. I, it's fine, I went and did a PhD, but the point is, is that by transforming the narrative in our minds, it transformed who we were, our consciousness became different, we worked together as a group of students and we changed the environment that, at the time that we were in it. Where does that come from? That comes from us in America. Let's think about it. We came to this country 1618 as indentured servants on a slave ship. We were traded for cargo. By 1646, certain events had taken place, and we were then, all of our rights were taken from us, and we were made permanent property. It, then we go through these periods where we had no protection under the Constitution. Once the Constitution was made and ratified, the Declaration of Independence in 1776, it didn't protect us. So we were chattel. Just like if you took this chair and you, you, you took it apart, there's no law that says you can't take apart that chair. It was the same law for us. If our masters wanted to beat us, kill us, rape us, do whatever they want, there was no protection under the law for three centuries. So we were, we, were, we were completely powerless, they thought. But through 200 years, 300 years, now 400 years of struggle, did we have an exodus out of America? Did black people leave this country? We transformed our condition. In the environment where we were being oppressed, we transformed our condition. We didn't leave, we did it here. I don't think there's a history of that taking place anywhere else in the history of mankind. Imagine that, the very people that gave you no rights, you now arrive to a place where you govern President Obama, you govern the rights of the people that 300 years prior to that said you had no rights. What is the Dred Scott case? What was that case for? Dred Scott was saying, hey, I am a slave, but I'm now in a free territory, and I am no longer a slave. And the judge came back and said, the black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. That's our reality. But it wasn't our reality. That was their reality. Our reality is we never stopped believing. We never stopped striving. We never stopped seeking. We didn't buy into how they saw us and how they wanted us. Our reality was is that we were pushing for freedom. We were pushing for truth. Understand that America said the fact that you just want to have babies, have a wife, have a husband, have a family is illegal. When we are saying we just want to do what every common person on this earth does, find a woman, have a child, raise a family, not be encumbered by your perspective. We have to fight for that. Now here's the problem with that. If you spend your life struggling to be what you are given out of the womb, what happens to your development? There's a wonderful saying that says that talent develops in tranquility, character in the full flow of life. When you have peace is where you develop your talent. In a peaceful environment is where you incubate who you are. And then once you've incubated your talent, you go out into the world and you become a character. But we didn't have that opportunity for centuries. Imagine this, they said you cannot read. It is illegal for you to read. 
Then they create a school system that says, okay, look, they, they don't read well. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine they said that, that, that uh, you can't, that, here's, here's an interesting scenario. Here in Los Angeles, I used to, at USC I taught a class on, on uh, conflicts in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles we had what was called racial covenants. And if you don't know what a racial covenant is, on a deed of a house it would say, that this house cannot be sold to someone that is not white. And these racial covenants in Los Angeles were around until like 1872 or 70, I mean in 1972 and 1978, somewhere around there. But the other thing was is that soldiers coming from the military were given GI bills and they were told, hey, you cannot spend this GI bill but in two places. One was Compton, one was Pacoima. So now watch this. Compton and Pacoima, these areas were only set up to handle a certain amount of population. Two, three hundred thousand people. Four hundred thousand are there. Five hundred thousand are there. Seven hundred thousand are there. Same thing in Pacoima. But the infrastructure is not expanded. The schools are not expanded. The environment is not changed to accommodate these people. So now all of a sudden, remember we started off talking about some lions in a cave. You get them trapped in these two environments. The racial covenants don't allow them to move anyplace else. Then the resources are slowly dwindling. That piece of meat. Then you drop the meat and then you start having gang violence and these other things. And you say this is these people's nature? It's the nature of artificial creation of poverty and pathology. And if we don't see it like that, then we don't understand it. So this is where we talk about awakening consciousness. What is that saying? What we're saying is we have to learn to look at this thing differently. Because if we just look at that piece of meat and say we need some more meat, we will never get out of that trap. If we just look at the bucket and say we need that bucket, we will never get out of that trap. We have to look at a system that puts us in a cage and then artificially says we don't have enough resources that pits you against one another and we've got to change that system. And that's how we were able to change our condition. That's what Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and these cats in the 60s were doing. They were transforming the environment, the system that created the pathology that had sucked us up. But today all we're looking at is the piece of meat. And this is why a, an awakening of our consciousness is now necessary. Because we gotta go metacognitive. We've gotta now start looking at how we think. We gotta start looking at how things are being uh, uh, put into our environment. We've gotta have a metacognitive perspective on this thing. And then we can start to change and make sure that the changes are permanent. Imagine this, Donald Trump is the president of the United States. I'm still waiting for him to speak a sentence clearly with, pri with, 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 with grammar. I don't even understand anything he says. <laughs> you tell us that in America it's about meritocracy. Are you saying that Donald Trump is the best that you have to offer? Here's a man that has admitted to be a rapist. He comes from a family of bigots. This is the best. This is the creme de la creme. Well, what kind of consciousness do you have to have to support something like that? Imagine 51% of white Christian women in America voted for him. What, what is that saying? So we are moving in the wrong direction. But I think the awakening is now about to begin again. Because if we don't, then we're seriously heading in the wrong direction. We're here at Cal State Northridge, and there's been some major events that have taken place at this campus that makes it so that we can all be here and get an education. Um, and the one thing that we must, must emphasize is that we have to not change our cognitive, because we focus on cognition here in, a, in an education environment, but we have to couple that with consciousness so that what we learn, we then can put to use for the common good of mankind because we are all here together, and we have to all work together. We can learn from each other's struggles. The genocide that took place in, with the Armenians and the Turks was real. 
right? We can't like, act like that didn't take place. We have to harmonize. We have to understand that. Pain, suffering is real. No matter who it takes place, once we suffer and we have pain, that should make us more sympathetic and empathetic towards other people that are struggling. Right? And so we can't say, oh, okay, because we struggle, we are the kings of struggle. No, we've got to transform our consciousness so that we can make sure that the things that have happened to us not only don't happen to us, but don't happen to others. And that's very important. And then, like the brother said, we have to then create you know, alliances. So that is my thing. We can open it up for questions and answers. But let's awaken our consciousness. journey that you brought us in, in terms of this African Holocaust, if you will. Um, I asked my students the other day in my black male class if they were duplicates or replicates. Ah. And I, I, I said that deliberately, and then after about three minutes, I put in African duplicate, I'm sorry, European duplicate and African replica. And they, they struggle with that for a minute. I always do these five minute rights and have them do a, a question scan of, of making these connections. I am inspired by that. I have a placid disposition to, to awaken my consciousness, you know, free from interruption of all the things that are, that are struggling. How important are children, you talked about that, in this village. How important are children in this village to continue to seek well, I think that's very interesting. Dr. Ben, I don't know if you guys know who Dr. Ben is, but he's one of our great scholars. He used to say all the time, if you take two adult rabbits and you put them in an oven and out come some baby rabbits, do you call them biscuits? <laughs> he would then say, well, then how do you take Africans out of Africa and put them in America and they're no longer African? And so when it comes to children, the problem becomes is, what is unique to African babies, black babies? How do you raise an African child? They are the basis of everything. If you know anything about the way the brain develops, 75% of your body's resources are used for the brain to develop while you're growing up. A child's brain doesn't con complete its development until they're 25 years old. So everything that happens in their environment is, is important and in, important to who they become. And so, and they are modeling their behavior off of the signals in the environment. And so this is where we talk about the cyclical nature of a lack of consciousness. Because if you're raising a child in an environment, what's the first part of the brain that develops? It's the amygdala. It's back here. It's that place where you find that you have the barbaric sort of flight response, that fight response. Your cerebral cortex, which is in the front part of your brain where your reasoning comes from, is the last part of your brain to develop. So if you put a child, it's already been proven, if a child is in a loving environment, they have dopamine experiences in that loving environment, they understand and they understand how to love and to give. But if a child is raised in an angry environment, they don't have that dopamine experience. And then they walk around looking for ways to have that experience. And the first time they have it sometimes may be with somebody sexually abusing them. It may be with a drug. It may be with alcohol. But whatever that trigger is, then they get trapped in that cycle, right? And so the way we inculcate the environment for our children to be raised in is hugely important. It, it, it is determinative, but they will be the result of the environment that you've created for them, no doubt. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is, 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 that's not, that's a, Black Lives Matter is a cry. Black My Lives Matter rises out of the idea that we are seeing in front of our faces black men gunned down by people with police, with, with, with guns, and there is no, there is no punishment for these men. So Black Lives Matter is not to say that other lives don't matter. Black Lives Matter is a cry to say, hey, look, you can't keep killing us. 
You can't roll up in a park and shoot a 12-year-old kid six seconds after you see him and nothing happens to you? Black Lives Matter is to say that you put together a system of laws, a system of, of policies, that you have a constitution and a declaration that says these sort of activities, these sort of civic relationships must be respected by the law. And when we don't see those relationships being respected by the law, we have to say enough is enough. So Black Lives Matter is not to say that other lives don't matter, it's to say that our lives matter. And if we behave like you're behaving, then we have chaos. So when that young gentleman in Texas got one gun and ran from rooftop to rooftop to rooftop shooting at police officers, the whole world was in an uproar. Because he, start, he was making a statement. If you don't think my life matter, I don't think your life matter. What does that lead to? Chaos and eye for eye, everybody's blind. And so Black Lives Matter is to say, listen, let's be egalitarian in how we disseminate law and order. And don't choose me to be the brunt of your anger. So it's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not this, it's not an eliminating sort of idea. It's just an idea of saying, hey, look, stop doing this to us. I don't want to send my son to down the street and somebody kills him and then that's just okay. And there's, there's no law to protect him. That takes us back to chattel, chattel slavery. Nobody was saying that uh, slavery was a problem. The abolishment of slavery was a problem. So that's what Black Lives Matter is. It's not a statement to say that other people don't matter. We definitely know that other people matter. But black people matter, and they're the ones that's being killed by these police officers. After um, hundreds of years of living in this artificial environment, how do you propose that one on an individual level can start to awaken their consciousness and see reality? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> That's a, that's a great question. One of the things you could do is just start by walking on the ground with your shoes off, right? There's something about this earth. That's true. I'm, I'm, I'm not making a joke of that. There's something about this earth in the, in the magnetic field that's in this earth, right? And there's something about the consciousness of the earth. We think that the earth is a dead being, but it's not. It's alive, right? And so there's something about who we are in our genes, in our DNA. And if we awaken our DNA, if we put ourselves back into the into the magnetic fields that we belong in, then our consciousness starts to elevate. The other thing becomes is that you have to have the guts to see what you see and hear what you hear. And we've got to stop transforming the narrative. If we see evil, it's evil. If we see somebody that's kind, it's kind. If I want to be loving, be loving. If I want to be, have a gesture of kindness, do a gesture of kindness. But don't see somebody that's evil and then articulate the reasons why they're evil because of this and that and that. No, that's just bad. So one of the things I think you can start to do with consciousness is just see what you see. Be honest about it. Let the emotional attachment to things that are not good for you, that are not good for our society, let them go. And start to see and behave the way you want the world to, to be. If you want to be in a loving environment, just be loving. If you want to be in a peaceful environment, be peaceful. Question, question. Are you going to write a book? <laughs> 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 yeah, I should, right? <laughs> I have no idea. It's, it's really, and I, I mentioned it I, I sh shortly. I said, how many times do you say to yourself, you want to be peaceful in a day? That's really an exercise. Like, every day I wake up and I decide how I want to feel. Now that forces me to, to be a certain way, right? And so 
I really do that exercise with myself. I want to be peaceful. I want to be kind. I want to have nothing but joy today, right? And when I get into that mindset, if I'm like that, that becomes transformative of your environment. I, let, me, let me say something to you, that we are, we are these energi energetic magnetic fields, right? And if you know anything about frequencies, frequencies are transformative, right? And so what does that mean? That if I come into your frequency field, either you're going to change or I'm going to change. Right? Because they're going to figure out how to come together. Right? So the higher we raise our frequencies by doing these things, it forces our environments to transform. Right? So it's like if you went into a gym and you had this guy that was really in shape and everybody that's been working out with him for five years or 600 pounds and over, you would say something's wrong with that guy because these people are not being transformed. Right? Something is wrong with this environment because here you got this guy that looks like he should be transformative, but he's not doing something right. The flip side of that is when you walk into an environment and a person's in shape and everybody that's following is in shape, that means that he's been transformative. His frequency is at a level that has been transformative. So look at the people that are around you, right? It's hard for you to sort of, you know, not study and not be positive and kind and be around me because I can't handle it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the people around me are going to be studying. They're going to be nice. They're going to be kind. You know what I mean? It's going to be that and kind in an environment because I'm transformative. So it really starts with you, but then just look at your environment, right? Do the trees grow in your neighborhood, in your house? Do the plants grow, right? Are the animals happy? You think I'm joking? I'm serious. You walk in somebody's house and all of the, the, the grass is dead, the trees is dead. Everything. There's no transformation taking place. Look at your environment. And then if your environment doesn't represent how you see yourself, then you know you've got to do some introspection and you've got to change some things about yourself. mentioned uh, looking back at our roots to see who we really were as people to become uh, something better, right, than where we are now, and especially right now that our uh, comparative culture requirements are under attack by the, by the university, you know, they want to take our, they don't want to make our culture a requirement to, for other people to learn, you know, and, and I don't think it's important just for us to learn about our own culture, but for other people to learn about our culture so that we won't get fooled like where we are right now. You know, and, and, and why not? You know, and uh, so how do you feel about that? That we have administration that are aware of these things, they're not doing anything about it. Like, you got the power to do something, but you're too afraid of getting your pockets hurt. You don't want to do nothing about it, you know? Like, but I, I want to thank you for bringing that because we needed that for sure. Imagine this statement there's nothing about your existence or the history of your existence on this earth that's important. Just think about that for a second. How is that possible? Who is it they told us that never told a lie? What, which, was, which was, who was, was it Abraham Lincoln or George Washington? Who never told a lie? Who told that lie? <laughs> right? We are being forced to learn all of these sort of weird things, like a, a guy flies around in a sleigh with reindeers and comes and brings you toys. And all of that's important, but the fact that your culture, what you've attributed to this earth is not, that, to me, is the level of insanity that requires our consciousness to be elevated. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you really have to, you really have to understand that. <clears throat> There's a great scholar in, this, in, 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 in last, last century. His name was Dr. John Henry Clark. And Dr. John Henry Clark made a statement. He said that the European never taught the African one thing for his benefit. And when he said that, he said it to me. When I was a student here, I sought out Dr. Clark, and I went to his house. It was 10 degrees in New York. I had never been out of Los Angeles before in cold weather. I had nothing on but a little skimpy jacket. I got off a plane. It's 10 degrees. I'm like, oh, my God. It was the worst thing ever. I get to his house. He lives on 95th and Amsterdam in, 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 in Harlem. And I knock on the door. I had had an appointment to go and talk to him. Um, he opens, his, his assistant opens the door. He's sitting, he's sitting behind the desk. As you walk through his house, it was a brownstone in Harlem. It was like a cave, a tunnel of books. Books was just everywhere. There was, there was, you could, you had to move books off the furniture. It was just everywhere. He's about 93 at the time. He had cataracts in his eyes. He could barely read, barely see. Um, and I sit there, and he says, young man, you've got a couple of minutes of my time. 
And so I asked him a question. And it was the hardest person in my world to talk to. You know why? Because every time I asked him a question, he would say, if you had read such and such book <laughs> on page such and such, paragraph such and such, you wouldn't have to waste my time asking me this question. <laughs> and so I'm trying to figure out how to talk to him. Man, I just flew all the way across the country. You have to answer one of my questions, right? Um, but it was the most difficult, and I start to understand that his level of scholarship, by the way, if you don't know who Dr. John Henry Clark was, he was a gentleman that trained and tutored Malcolm X before all of Malcolm X's uh, debates. So Dr. John Henry, and so finally I said to him, tell me what slavery was like. And then he said, he thought about it. He said, you know what? To be a slave is to not have any decision-making power in your life. If you opened up a door, someone else could come and close that door, and you couldn't open it back. If you were in love with a woman, someone else can come and take that woman, and you couldn't even utter that your displeasure. So to be a slave is to be absent of any sort of decision-making power over your life. I was like, whoa, because I had never heard, heard it put like that. He said, when I was a child, he said, I would just walk by ice cream stores, and I would look at ice cream, and I wanted some ice cream so bad, he said, and I couldn't afford it. He said, now that I'm an adult, I don't even like ice cream. <laughs> I don't know what that has to do with the story. But anyway, <laughs> um, but D John Henry Clark sort of was saying that, you know, when, when, you, when, you, when you seek out these people, he was part of our history. And because he was a living part of our history, I went and sought him out. But I also went and sought out I Ivan Van Sertima. And I went and talked to the people in these minds because I wanted to hear from them why they were alive. Maya Angelou, I, when I brought her to this campus, it's because I had went and talked to her while she was teaching at Rutgers. Right? And I had that relationship with her. Right? Minister Louis Farrakhan, I sat at his, at his house with him. And Dr. Naeem Akbar was there, and he gave me his book. He said, read this book, young man, and tell me about this book. I looked at him like, what do you mean? He said, take an hour, read the whole book. I said, I can't even read two pages in an hour. Are you kidding me? And then we sat down at dinner. It was Dr. Naeem Akbar, Dr. Nathan and Julia Hare, and all of these great minds were sitting at this table. And I'm sitting and listening to these conversations, and I'm saying, I really got to take my education serious because I don't know what they're talking about. Wow. And they're speaking English. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so that's what propelled me was being not only understanding and have a desire for the history, but also seeking out the great minds in my culture. And so that by the time I came to this school, I'd had these conversations and these interactions. And I'm like, no, you, we, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, we got to have some of this over here so that we can all get, you know what I mean, on fire. And that's what that's about. So, yeah, your culture, your history is so important. Absolutely. No, I, I just want to join uh, what came and express the praise for everything that you're doing. Uh, when, you, when you first got here, you had the same fire. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable that it's still is strong and elevating. I'm really so delighted that you are affiliated with the campus. We need to have you here. Yes, sir. Have you here often. Um, we have not gotten rid of the cross-cultural competency. Students are still going to have to take those units. So anybody thought they were going to get out of it, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Your commitment to academic excellence has always just been a thing of beauty and something that has been very inspiring to me over the years. Talk to our students about how to navigate the experience of getting an education here at the highest levels of this campus. Certainly. And that's, I think that's very important. When I came to the school, I felt like the academic requirements were far too low for me. They weren't challenging. So I, I just look at it like this. If my barometer is here, right? And their barometer is here. And I meet their barometer here. Have I done my work? No. So when I would go to class here at this school, if they gave me one book to read, I would read five others. And the reason was because I was challenging myself to get here. Because I knew I wanted to go get a PhD. And I knew that the challenge that was here wasn't going to make me competitive, right? I didn't care what their structure was. I had my own structure, my own desire, so that I challenged myself way further than what it was because that was the only way to do it. It was like the best athlete, the, 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 you know it, the, the, the team will give you a certain workout, but the best athletes will do that workout then start working, right? And so that was my mentality. I'm going to do the work you say do, then I'm going to start doing the real work. 
And so that now I'm sitting in the class, not only did I know the documentation and the literature that they knew, but then I knew to question it. I had some altering authors. So think about it. You're in a class of psychology, and you're studying Freud. And Freud is talking about the id, the superego, and all of these other things, right? Jung is talking about archetypes and subconscious. Hey, hey, maybe there ain't a subconscious. Ah, maybe there ain't an id. Maybe, well, do, ha, how, how would you know it if you haven't studied other theories, right? There are other theorists out there that disagree with Jung, Freud, and, and Skinner, Adler. They disagree with those guys, right? If you're looking at uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, there are, there are other theorists out there that don't believe and don't agree with his theories of relativity. But if you just learn about his theory of relativity and you think you've learned something, you have not. You've just been indoctrinated. And so for me, it was how do I make myself the best student? What is the goal that I can do, right? And it is personal. It's okay, we all have them. It is, it is personal. And let me tell you something, you have to be able to set your own standards. You have to have a design for where you're going, right? And then you've got to put together a plot to get there. And let me tell you something, I am being very serious. In most academic institutions, what they require you is not enough for you in your time. That's just period, right? And so, and, and I'll never forget, when I got to uh, uh, USC and I was working on my doctor, doctor program, we walked into class, this gentleman had his double PhD in physics. His name was Dr. Krieger. And, he, and I'm gonna tell you what he did. He took Adam Smith, both volumes, and put them on the table. Then he took one of the hardest books I ever read in my life called A Theory of Justice. He puts it on the table. Then he puts a book on the table that's called The, um, the Physics of the Walls of a Social Consciousness. He puts it on the table. Then he puts on a book called The Theory of Town and City. And he lays those out. And we're all looking there saying, yo, that's a whole lot of reading for this whole year. For one semester, this, don't even know we got other classes? He said, come back next week prepared to discuss every one of these books. <laughs> it was 2,500 pages of literature. And every week we had 2,500 pages of literature. Had I not challenged myself to be uh, at a higher level, I would have never, man, I would have walked out of that class and gave him my scholarship back. <laughs> are, you, are you kidding me? And so, so you have to really understand that to get somewhere, you've got to plot out a course. And I'm telling you, status quo is never good enough. It is never good enough. And, and, and I got through that program with, I was, I was debating and being invited to lectures all over the world, but because I was working really hard. I'll tell you another quick story. The dean of the department, was, his name was Dr. Blakely. He had written about 35 books. That's where I went to that school um, that's looking at economics. And he, he came to me and he said, Leslie, I want to, there was a book that, that uh, Michael Porter wrote that was called The Competitive Advantages of the Inner City. And Dr. Dr. Blakely said, Leslie, we're going to write a book and critique this book, right? Because it didn't make sense and he knew I was from the inner city. So he said, let's figure that out. He said, come back in about three weeks and we'll start to exchange drafts. So I worked three weeks, I had written like 20 pages. I was, had worked, I had researched, done my 20 pages, you know, and I'm like, I'm feeling good about it. I put my 20 pages down. He put down 100 pages. <laughs> and I said, yo, wait, wait, you're the dean, you're teaching, all this stuff. But he had written 100 pages to my 20, right? And we go on to publish and, and do this work and, and challenge Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Porter's uh, work on, on inner city economics. But the point was, is that there was another level, that these genius guys were at another level. And for me, I wanted to compete on that level, right? And if you didn't, the program I was in, you couldn't get a B. It was A or you're out. There was no A minus, no B, it's C you. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, tell me about, because if that hunger starts early on, we talked about environments growing up. Tell me about three people who really made a difference when you were young, and what were some of those characteristics that gave you the hunger to make you want to set that, that for that, that bar high? Because it, it starts young. That's very interesting. So I was born in Pacoima Projects. I don't know if you guys know where that is, but that's right over there off of Van Nuys and Glen Oaks. Um, and then we moved over to Lehigh, and then we moved up into Lakeview Terrace. But I remember, one of the things I remember seeing growing up in the projects in over at Pacoima, I see dudes hanging on the corner drinking in the morning. You know, and they would be drinking whatever. You know, it'd be like 8 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. 
and they would always be cursing and yelling at me. You such and such, such, get your whoa, 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 right? And that to me, I said, man, I never want to end up on that corner like that. So that was one thing. It was that there was something in my environment, and I don't know, I'm not saying this is healthy or not, but there was something in my environment that says, I don't want to be like that, right? <laughs> then the second thing is, I went to this church called Calvary Baptist Church, and the preacher's name was uh, Hillary Broaddus. And he also used to always say, if, if you smoke and you drink, you're going to hell. So I never smoked to this day, and I've never drank to this day. So I was scared because I was in this environment that said, there are some ways you have to live your life. There's some ethics. There's some, some, some involvement. And going to church every, every week with those kind of messages being put down, that you have to be something, you have to have character, you have to have ethics, you have to have morals, right? You have to have a direction. That was very important. That was a cultural statement. <clears throat> and then the third thing was, I, I, I was uh, a friend of mine's when I was really young. I was probably about 14. And a friend of mine said, hey, Leslie, come over. I'm going to come pick you up. We're going to go over here. And it was to Barry White's house. And Barry White told us a story. He said when he was a kid that every day he would walk from Compton to Capitol Records. And that that journey every day, he would just sit there and say, hey, I'm a singer, I'm a composer. And finally one day, they let him start to compose for them. And the singer that he was composing for didn't show up. So he said, oh, I'll just record the track for him. When he gets here, he can do it. So he did that, and the president of, of the company heard it and said, oh, we like this. And they said, yeah, well, the singer's coming in tomorrow. He said, no, 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 we like that guy. And he goes on to become a legend. And that story, I've never forgot, it stayed with me, was this idea of being persistent, right? And, and without even understanding and knowing what the end game was, he didn't know if they were going to let him into Capitol Records, but every day he talked about getting up and going. And we would go over there, and he would always have these kind of messages. So we had a mentor, if you will. We had somebody telling us that was great. You know, you, this was a great man saying, I did some very basic things to get here. You know, and it made it very simple. And so, you know, that's, that's where sort of my drive came from, was those, seeing those things. Yep. Um, I want to see if you elaborate a little more on a uh, question you asked earlier uh, regarding uh, how does one, how would you elevate your And, and, and secondly, what would you say to uh, a young man, a young woman that you recognize that has no ambition, has no consciousness or no hope uh, to get them to think about changing their consciousness? Mm. It's interesting. I, I just by hearing you, I, I'm thinking about Lutza. I don't know if you ever checked out the Dow, but Lutza would say that a good man is a bad man's teacher, and a bad man is a good man's job. Meaning that you can spend your whole life trying to convert people, right, and never be able to do it, right? He would say that you need to accept the good and the bad, right, and not judge them. So from that perspective, I would always say two things. One is discipline, excuse me, awareness, discipline, implementation. You first, if you want to change your consciousness, you've got to become aware that if that's possible. Whether that's reading different kind of books, going to different places, awareness is the beginning. You cannot even begin to start the journey until you become aware that there is a journey. Mm -hmm. Then once you become aware of it and you study what this thing called, and, and for everybody it's going to be different, like you know what I mean? So then you have to have some discipline. You have to discipline yourself to start to try to understand and to be consistent at your becoming awareness. And then implementation. You actually have to do. You have to create, you have to study, go find a teacher, whatever it takes, whatever works for you, but you have to implement it. So you got to become aware, you got to become disciplined. And what I mean by discipline, sometimes we got to change our eating habits, sometimes we got to change our sleeping habits, sometimes, you know what I mean? We have to, you know, we have to do something, right? And that takes, you know, discipline, and then you have to implement a strategy. I think that's very important. And when it comes to kids that everybody, no kid is born not wanting to do something. When you get a kid that's unmotivated, that seems unmotivated, life has done that to him, right? And so the key to that, however, is that somewhere buried in that pile of unmotivation, there is a spark. The issue becomes, I had a, a math teacher once say to me, Leslie, the hardest thing about solving the most difficult problems is figuring out how to look at it, 
is once you figure out how to look at it, the solution is evident, mm -hmm. right? And so just even with a kid, the hardest problem by solve, dealing with somebody that's unmotivated is figuring out how to look at that kid to analyze it, to figure out what it takes to motivate them. Once you figure out what it takes to motivate them, it's easy. The hard part is the assessment, the analysis, and that's where we get bogged down. So I would say that you really, and you know, in psychology they have this thing called functional fixedness, this idea that we all just look at one thing, things one way, right? And that becomes the hard thing. We have to sort of take that 360 degree perspective. You gotta look at a problem from many different er ways until you figure out what the approach is and then you implement it. You guys are making all my academic stuff come back. <laughs> come on, go. Um, I noticed earlier when you said that it takes to you see someone else suffering, you want to not want that to happen again. I want to relate it to like our political situation. You know, you had those of us who knew Trump showed what type of person he was. We had those of us who knew what he was. We spoke out against him and those who still voted for him anyway. And now with the shutdown and all that, it's affected them now too. And I see all these people that are like, oh, we voted for him. And you know, now our buddies hurt. So do you, what, why do you think it takes to that? Why do you think it takes to get to stuff like that? Or do you think, what's gonna be the last straw with him where it's gonna get everyone to come together and speak out so that doesn't happen again? You know, America has this, 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 this love affair with the great white hope. <laughs> you know, it's in sports, it's in politics, it's in, you know, and we gotta get away from that. You know, as long as we start saying that what makes you qualified is the color of your skin, right? Then you will always be trapped because you're looking at the wrong measurements. You're using the wrong metric, right? If I have to be a white man of a certain age to be considered to be a leader, then that's not the right metric. Right? Think of it like this. If you were doing, uh, if, you, if I said to you, hey, I want you to go out there and measure the depth of a pool, how deep it is, and I gave you a thermometer to do that, <laughs> what would you come back with? That metric doesn't make any sense. And that's what's taking place, right? So it's really, it's that foolish, though. Like, we are not evaluating people based on metrics that give us the proper feedback. You know, when you, and so that, 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 that's the Trump, Trump issue 100% of the way. Because if you really said, okay, we want to evaluate him as a candidate and we use the proper metrics, there's nothing I think that he represents that would make sense. Right? But it is that illusion that we refuse to, and we talked about discipline, awareness, discipline, implementation. It's this idea that we refuse to actually use common sense. I mean, I don't think, it's not complicated. That, that is not a complicated, nothing about him is complicated. <laughs> Zero. But it's just the wrong metric. And we have been in love with the white, great white hope, you know, for three centuries now. You just have to look a certain way. This is sort of a part of the concept of the major contradiction in that, you know, we call ourselves a Christian nation, but we're a nation in which everything goes. So we've got all of these mixed messages being sent, especially to young people. We've got reality TV, we've got all, and then there's a, an attack on intelligence, and there's an attack on what's called political correctness, which is just the ability to coexist. So then we're expecting them to be able to figure it out with all of these contradictions and mixed messages. And so then they arrive at, uh, um, in college, conflicted, be, having been told what to do, unable to think for themselves. And we have to do this whole, basically, um, deprogramming just to even get them to, to know what critical thinking is. In fact, on Twitter, there's no uh, a link for leading. It's all following. Everything's about following. And social media is taking the lead on that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's it's... It's very complex in terms of, it's not as simple as when we were growing up. When you were expected to read, when if you didn't know who James Baldwin was, and, and uh, Huey P, and George Jackson, you didn't have the, that information informed us, not to mention we had James Brown on the mic talking about say it out, I'm black and proud. Now we've got a flip of a reverse of that. You understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I've been, I'm saying that as an educator, these are the kinds of issues that the students are bringing to this occasion. Their, their, their uh, wards of the court foster youth, 
parents on drugs. These are hardcore issues that they're having to find themselves in the process of working through. So I'd like for you to just speak to that complexity. You know, I, it's, it's, it's interesting because that you say that because, you know, the problem you have is this, is that as an educator, your job is to get people in a certain subject matter to acquire a certain amount of knowledge and then to move on, right? The problem, however, is, is that the students are not coming as, as candidates to be students, right? They're coming as candidates to be therapy. They need therapy, right? They need help. And so the problem is, is that if you are in a setting that should be therapeutic, but yet the setting is educational, then you will never be effective. Um, and so, so then it becomes, from an academic perspective, does the academicians, does the pedagogues have the volition to transform the curriculum and the, the classroom environment in order to meet the needs of the students? Because you just clearly outlined that these students are not here to, and have the capacity to just move straight into education, that they have some other work that needs to be done. And you can't ignore that other work. Now, but you have to ignore that other work because you have a set, a, a, a finite time that you have to do what you have to do. But the big problem is, is that if that were the case, if that's the case, then, you know, the curriculum in this environment has to transform itself. If it doesn't, then it's going to just be friction. You can't, you can't teach somebody to do something that they're not prepared to learn, right? There's this old saying that the teacher doesn't show up until the student's ready to learn, right? And so if students are not ready to learn, then what are you teaching them? Some of them don't know how to learn. That's what I'm saying. It's the same thing. So the point is, is that in this environment, you have to be able to transform the environment to meet the needs of the student, if the student is most important. Thank you so much. Now, now real quick, before, before, before we uh, um, uh, adjourn this, I want to say that there's a, African proverb that says, until lions have their own storytellers, tales of the, uh, of the lion have always glorified by the hunter. Thank you for being at Lion for yes, us. On the, on the uh, flyer itself, it said, pass the rock. And everybody has a rock, yes. uh, Brother Blessing. Could you talk a little bit about what we want them to do with yes. this rock? So my cousin called me. He said, look, Leslie, we do a thing that's called pass the rock. What we do is we take a rock and we write a black history moment on that rock. And then we hand it to somebody during the day. And the idea on this campus is they should keep taking the rock. And whoever ends up with the rock at the end of the day, they write a different saying and they pass it the next day. So pass the rock, that's what we're gonna do. We write something that's inspirational, we write something that's inform informative, and we just give it to someone else. And you just give them that instruction. And every day somebody's passing the rock and we just start to transmit you know, information that way. Pass the rock. I have three sharpies, the red, the black, and the green. And so I'm going to put them over here. So as you're walking out, write something on this rock. And then give it to somebody on campus. Give it to somebody else. Let's give Brother Leslie another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yep. This is mine. <laughs> Thank you so much.